process, they have these uh, cardboard fancy heads. Nice. Like sit and seat. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, like seat. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Where they kind of the heads mounted on springs, so they're yeah. kind of like looking. So, so do you think we should still talk in the mic for the uh, camera? Like, do you, do you think does it feed I into? Think. Should should we? Does the camera? I mean, does the mic feed into the camera audio? Okay, so we should use the yeah. mics. Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> good. That's cool. So, um, all right. I thought there might have been some other people that were headed over in here, but that's fine. Okay. It's it's like, dude, it's like a live action Gweek. Yeah, or something. exactly. That's, that's what it is. It is. So Ed, man, it's great to uh, to meet you in person. It's weird that we haven't. It is. Th that is a weird thing, the way freelance works, where you can work for somebody for like two and a half years, and the only conversations you've had were on podcasts or just, you know, recorded. You never see your boss, you yeah. know, which is, which is an attractive part of being in freelance life to an extent, but uh, it is weird, like, how we've sort of been connected for a while, but this is the first time we've met. Yeah. Have you met any of the other Boing Boing people? Rob lives in Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. Okay. But it still took two years to <laughs> even meet him <laughs> because I, di I didn't want to be, I didn't want to present myself as like unattractive to him or, or like, or like that came out wrong. Uh, <laughs> like I didn't want him to think I was an asshole and kick me off of off of uh, doing the comic or something oh like wow. that. So I almost avoided him. That's funny. He, w I'm, he would never think that. Yeah, no, we, we get along just, That's just great. Cool. Heather, yeah. his wife is very cool. He's also, Rob's a, a really good artist, too. Have you seen his He's work? shy about it. He's he won't, he won't share. shy, but he's really fast. If we need, like, a, a painting, he does, like, his paintings in Photoshop. If we need an uh, illustration because we don't have, like, clearance for a photo or something, he'll, like, knock something out in 15 minutes. Man, he's so shy about it. I did not know about that. Mm -hmm. But I met, um, I met, uh, a couple of oh, I met Maggie. Uh, I, I went to uh, I went to uh, Harvard, mm -hmm. and gave gave a gave a talk about hip hop and comics. Mm -hmm. And she's on a fellowship. Oh yeah, out there right. right now. And she that's showed cool. up, and, and we hung out. Like we went to the hip hop archive after hours, and and uh, had a had a real good time. Yeah, Maggie's great. Yeah, yeah she's off to doing interesting Sh stuff. She's by by accepting this this fellowship thing at Harvard. It precludes her from doing work. Like it's like you're a part of this thing, and your job is to just learn as much as you can for a year. Like it, there's, it, she doesn't have to produce. In fact, it, she's discouraged from like producing stuff. Yeah. Like so we we don't have her as a writer for right. a while, which is kind of a drag. But right. But yeah. How did you uh, f find out about Boing Boing and like approach us? I don't remember. Did you just shoot me an email? Um. You guys have reviewed my self-published comics, mm -hmm. uh, WYSIWYG, yeah. about computer hacker yeah. culture. And Corey and reviewed your uh, PCAR uh, uh, Beats uh, bi biographies, Beats right. profiles. Right. So when I finished the hardcover WYSIWYG collection, um, I didn't have a plan for what was coming next. And, and, and I read Boing Boing regularly. Um, I was checking out the site, and there was a link to just click on each of your names and uh, it would take the the reader to a different s website and I clicked on Corey's and he had a press photo on his crap hound website mm -hmm. of it's a photo of him at the at the uh, typewriter and hi all of his books are behind him and it's a super high res picture so I clicked on that and I was like staring like I was like narcissistically looking for my comics on his shelf uh -huh. <laughs> and I found them Nice. Uh, so I was like, hey, maybe this means he, he likes my comics or something. So then I sent you guys just an email like, hey, I know what it was. And Gadget uh, commissioned like a, a weekly strip from me or mm -hmm. something. And it was so corny. Like I, I didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. like, but, but it was one of those things where like, you know, I could use the money. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, hey, guys, this is what I'm doing for Gadget. I don't want it. I, w I would rather do something cool for, y for you guys uh -huh. <laughs> uh, if you'll have me. And then you That's guys great. did, and it was wow. awesome. Yeah. Wow. <coughs> so, this uh, you uh, appear to me like you're probably in your like late twenties or early thirties. Yeah, thirty-two. Okay. And, and and I'm meaning this as a compliment. Or, or uh oh, you uh, really when you look at your work, it looks like something that's coming from someone who's probably like my age, like in their fifties, because I'm seeing somebody who's like is is uh got a lot of hooks into the into the, like the 70s and the 80s 
And so, and, and I don't see that with a lot of young cartoonists. You have a deep love and knowledge of comics from that era. And a lot of cartoonists today, I don't even think they read comics. You can kind of tell they didn't. Right. And so, so what's what's the story with that? I've I've always been around comics. I would say that people my age, a little bit older and a little bit younger, um, were like the last vestige of of newsstand readers. We could go to the grocery store with mom, have several spinner racks of comics to choose from. We're the, I'm the last of that. Uh, so I grew up with comics forever. And comics to me, in my mind, look like the hip hop family tree stuff, like, like the yellowed paper, the dot, ben, you know, the bende, color separations, and things like that. And you are right though, because as we k I keep going to different festivals and meeting new cartoonists, a lot of people have started, um, they discovered comics late. Like they might have even been in a fine arts program for a couple of years when they read uh, Jimmy Corrigan seems to be the gateway drug mm -hmm. to the fine <laughs> art uh, cartoonist. Mm -hmm. So these people are like 19 years old. And it's pretty cool because um, they don't have everything figured out. They're not prejudiced by years of fanboy mm -hmm. stuff. So sometimes like a really cool gem of storytelling mechanics almost like gets unearthed by them because I don't have all this this pre-programming mm -hmm. so I'll steal it for myself because the rest of their comic might not be so good <laughs> because they still have to learn yeah. about the yeah yeah there's a, there's a lot to learn there um so uh you uh are basically like self-taught right did you I mean I know you went for a year at, at Qbert and I want to ask about that but how did you what, what, what was your process of learning how to draw comics when you were a kid? Um, it was just uh, the, the area that I'm from in Pittsburgh um, was, was pretty sketchy. Like I've, uh, I'm pretty sure if I would see a psychologist or something, I have some form of PTSD because I s like m every we would move around, but in the same town, uh, everywhere we moved, somebody would get shot and killed next door or behind our house or something. And I've seen, you know, dead bodies growing up and things. Um, so I stayed indoors, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so I stayed indoors a lot in my childhood. It just drew like constantly. And I was never even the best in school or anything like that, but, um, but I just, I wanted to be, and I just kept going. And then slowly the work, I could see improvement and it gave me incentive to keep going. Uh, there, there were these, you know, extracurricular art programs that that um, my parents enrolled me in, and one of them happened to be like a comic book production class. And the conceit of the entire class was uh, write a story. The class is like ten weeks, so so budget your time and create deadlines so that at the end of the class um, you'll have a finished comic, and we will produce ten copies for every kid in the in the class and there were 15 kids in the class so there were 150 copies of my comics out there when I was you know 12 or something and that was like the initial jolt like the the initial kind of kind of addiction of like print that comic like a stack of yeah yeah comics. just knowing that 150 of these things are out it seemed to impress my parents it's like oh mm -hmm. look you have a you have a comic and, mm -hmm. and it was it was a very cool feeling that uh, I w I've have just constantly been chasing and, and indulging in um, ever since. Was your father a comic book reader? No, he he wasn't. But um, but uh, I just he had me pretty late in his life, and I think he was very excited to finally be a father. So I don't remember a time before having comics. Like like there were always stacks of those, always stacks of toys. Like he was just like spoiled me like crazy mm -hmm. and comics were a part of that where I would just like I grew up with stacks of them. Mm -hmm. um, what artists at that time when you were a kid were you studying to learn from and what did you learn from particular artists that you really admired? Uh, there, there was this documentary comic book confidential um, that, w that aired on A&E at some point when I was like nine or ten that, um, that really sort of opened up some synapses or something and, and made me aware of like what kind of comics exist because I didn't know about comic shops or anything like that. Like I said, I would just go to the grocery store with mom and dad. I'm flipping through this, the channels and I stop because I see Spider-Man on the screen. 
the Stan Lee part of that uh, documentary takes place right before the underground comics portion. So Robert Crumb is the very next guy that is talking about comics in the, in the flick. And uh, the most important thing that I saw in that documentary was uh, the were these comics that that Crumb was sh sh sort of showing off from about Fritz the Cat that that he made when he was a kid. And you could see the blue line notebook paper. You could see that they were made in pencil. And that was very democratizing because I had a notebook and I had, uh, you know, I had pencils. So, uh, so it, it was almost like it gave me permission to keep, to, to make comics or something. Like I don't need um, 11 by 17 Strathmore Bristol with a number two Windsor Newton brush mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, you know, just like, just make comics. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he's a big influence. Everybody in that movie, mm -hmm. the Hernandez brothers, Charles Burns. Yeah. I, I remember being especially impressed for some reason by Jaime Hernandez uh, drawing with, the, I think on a whiteboard with Magic Martin, yeah. just quick little, like little cute tiny versions of Maggie and Hopi, like little kid versions or something. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to him about that and, and he said that um, it's a good thing that the audio wasn't captured during that sequence because his brother Gilbert Mm -hmm. was behind the scenes like making fun of the way he drew boots and 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 his if you remember there was a car and the car uh -huh. just looked like you know like a two-year-old drew it uh -huh. it was great though yeah, yeah yeah it was yes uh i remember reading in some interview that you you didn't have much you don't really think that much about stan lee well well i mean he served an important function but you know i truly believe there's a reason that Stan Lee gets to gets to be like a 93 year old man and Jack Kirby's been dead for almost like you know what 25 years or something mm -hmm. like that uh you know like just working professionally in a creative space you see people who have the ability to charm and coast mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh he's impossible not to like that guy you know yeah. like when you see him on the screen it, it's like oh there's Stan Lee but um you know that's interesting yeah i i uh, did you see that jonathan ross bbc thing about no. uh where is steve ditko no stan lee looks terrible in that thing man when when they're because he didn't have his lawyer present mm -hmm. and uh and uh he was a answering these questions unfiltered and he just wouldn't say certain things like jonathan ross is like so would you say that that uh steve ditko is a is a creator of spider-man and stan lee goes if Steve wants to believe that, he can believe that he's the creator of Spider- Like, just that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, it's company man politics, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, That's more free-spirited. Yeah. Um, I, I ha had a dislike for, for Stanley because I was, like, a huge Kirby fan when I was, like, 16. It was, like, this was in, like, 1976. Kirby came to Colorado, and I, like, just followed him around from his comic book store to comic book store. And, uh... Uh, somebody asked him, like, you know, what was the relationship between you and Stan Lee? And Kirby said, I did the whole damn thing. Everything. It's all mine. <laughs> and so I, I believe Kirby, you know. I mean, and so uh, so I, I have always been telling Carla, my wife, like, you know, I, uh, Stan Lee, you know, I don't like him, blah, blah, blah. And so she, had, she, was she got assigned to write a story about uh, I interviewing Stan Lee about something. And she got on the phone and he, like, charmed the, the pants off her. And she said, he's the nicest guy. I love him. I don't ever want to hear you say anything bad about him again. So it's, he, it's magic. He's, he's got, yeah, he's got charisma. Did you ever read the Comics Journal interview that Gary Groth did with, with Kirby? I always like to imagine that version of Stan Lee in my mind where, because Kirby was dealing with him through basically his career, and he's older than Stan Lee, so the earliest, his earliest interactions with Martin Goodman when they were selling Captain America to, to that enterprise, Stan Lee's like 11 years old with a piccolo, like just like <laughs> running around it. And Simon and Kirby are just like, get this kid out of yeah, here. Yeah, I do remember that. And then, <laughs> and then uh, there's the part in the interview where Kirby's talking about, um, he was coming into the offices of, I guess it was called Atlas at the time. And there are, there are like movers taking couches and things out of the, the timely Atlas office. And Stan Lee's there crying. And Kirby's like, listen, relax, breathe deep. I'm gonna save you guys. Like, like, let's make some comics, 
everything will be all right. Tell the movers to put the, put the couches down. And then that's when they made Fantastic Four. And, and like Kirby says this in the interview. It's very, you can imagine wow. the Kirby crackle behind his head as he's, he's uh, that's espousing great. his knowledge. Yeah, I, I remember reading things like Kirby would be like helping his friends out on, that, that were like missing deadlines by like drawing eight pages on his lunch hour for them. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's amazing. So, so uh, w what do you think you learned from Kirby about your own, th your, the way you do comics? Um, a lot of it's like more intuitive. I, th I would say that his, his effect on the storytelling of popular comics is so deeply ingrained that you can't help but be influenced by him in a mm -hmm. storytelling fashion. But also with the stuff I'm doing like on Hip Hop Family Tree where there are panels that could be redundant in as much as how many times can you draw a guy with a microphone on a stage mm -hmm. rapping. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been pulling a lot of his dynamics and foreshortening to tr try to make more exciting mm -hmm. images. And I think mm -hmm. that that's like, that's like, you know, the strongest thing that I've been stealing from him. I'll just look through old comics for different compositions and just put them right in there. But in hip hop, we call that sampling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite Kirby period? I, I, the 70s stuff, um, the fourth world and beyond, the stuff he did for Marvel, Devil Dinosaur, every single panel looks like a piece of pop art. I'm talking mm -hmm. like it could be a hand turning a doorknob and it's so perfectly composed, the blacks are everywhere. I guess like the, the, maybe the better question would be like, who's your favorite inker? Because I love so much mm -hmm. Kirby. And okay, who's I, your favorite inker? I would say like a Mike Royer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how about yeah. you? Uh, he's not that popular, but I, I really like D. Bruce Barry. Yeah, yeah, things. the commandy yeah. stuff. Yeah, but Royer was great. Any, ri almost anybody but Vince Coletta. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right, right. Who probably inked with a toothbrush. Yeah, did you, did you read that, that Marvel book by Sean Howell talking about how, like, Vince Coletta had, like, ties with organized crime and, <laughs> and, 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 and his, and his, um, his way of making money was through, like, prostitution and he would show up at the offices in, in a limo, smoke billowing out with, with women in the car, and Jim Shooter would like run down, give him a job, and then accept a job back, and then like that's wow. just how they, that's just how that's they- That's amazing. Uh, right, right, right. And, and he was comic, inking comics was just kind of like- a That's his straight gig. Uh -huh. that, and, and I like to <laughs> imagine- <Stack> shelter. <laughs> <laughs> I like to imagine, uh, <laughs> you like, they're sitting, like all the wise guys are sitting around playing cards and stuff, and they're like, so what do you do? You like you like draw like naked guys <laughs> like wrestling around each other. Oh, Vinny here is like drawing these naked guys sweating all over each other. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, so uh, uh, w another one person that that comes to mind sometimes when I see your work for some reason is Duranko. I've heard that, mm -hmm. and and that's a function of my inability at foreshortening as good as Kirby because that's like how Steranko would do it. I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about because I've been called, so like the, like my arm, like it's just, it's like my foreshortening is, is a little quirky and off. Mm -hmm. I'm just not a master of it. And like neither was Steranko. It was like he was looking at a lot of Kirby and taking, it, it was almost like Steranko like learned to draw comics from looking at other comics, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and so there is a wow. quirkiness, the balance yeah. of the figure is always mm -hmm. like a little wonky or something. Mm -hmm. I recommend the um, Steranko Artist Edition, by the way. Those real big books where they have oh the facsimile yeah, pages. But I don't have his, that one. his is great because there's so many notes for the colorist. There's a lot of paste up mm -hmm. stuff where he's cutting things out of newspaper and just like, you know, he'll cut out the a newspaper, uh, 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 image of Statue of Liberty out of a newspaper and just, psh, that's the background. Cool. It's very cool. Well, he's, he's an interesting person, you know. Um, I'll say. Got into self publishing. Uh, <laughs> did that uh, uh, Steranko history of comics and then he had that kind of like a Spanish magazine about movies yeah so media media scene called. yeah media right. scene uh, a magic book that he did the illustrations for we were at a convention with him uh, in Fort Wayne Indiana and he was like the guest of honor or whatever and uh, one of the questions I've because I'm a fanboy first no doubt um, I was curious about his self-publishing enterprises because um, because he was, I wouldn't say he was like successful, like he didn't become a zillionaire, uh, a, a self-publisher or something, but he, he existed and prospered and kept going. And I, so I went up to him and I asked him, Steranko, how did you survive where like Gil Kane had Man Called Savage and Black Mark that he, that mm -hmm. he put out, Wally Wood had Wit's End, 
Um, but those guys, they, they sort of, they had to shutter their business yeah, pretty early. Yeah, humbug. Right. So how did you sustain and prosper when these guys failed? And, and he looked up at me, because he's like this tall, and said, let me tell you something. <laughs> I'm smarter than those guys, and I'm tougher. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, tell me a little bit about, about going to uh, Kubert School, H how you got in and what you learned. I know not everyone gets in. You have to have a, like a pretty well-developed portfolio. I thought so too when when I when I uh, when I <laughs> when, when I was when I was gearing up, um, I was always very hard on myself in terms of uh, the the quality of my work. Uh, so in middle school and high school, the goal was to just just get to be good enough to go to the Kubert School because I read all that stuff about how it's so exclusionary and and hard to get into. And I just imagine every student would be like Steve Bissett, Rick Veach. John Totalbin, Tim Truman, like that, mm -hmm. that quality of artist. Um, so that was my, my focus through high school. Set my portfolio, like did the portfolio review, was so nervous, and I eventually got there. And I'm like, wow, like I'm the youngest person out of my year, which, I which was cool. Um, and I'm, I wasn't the best, but I definitely wasn't the worst, mm -hmm. you know? And there were like 26 year olds who were in there like, oh yes, I'm just giving it a shot again. Like I, I failed. Uh, I failed out um, five years ago, so I'm giving it a go. Uh, and I just saw like a lot of crappy work. But what the the function of that school is um, to basically teach and train artists who can make reliable deadlines. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't about art, mm -hmm. and it wasn't about quality. It was about it was about mediocrity. It was about Ba creating a baseline thing so that you could get as much work and churn out as much like product as as possible. Um, so spiritually, I didn't identify mm -hmm. with it at all. Um, did you get anything out of it at all? I did. I got a lot out of it because I'm a visual. I'm a visual learner. Um, so when whenever a teacher would give a visual demonstration of just like um, some in inking techniques, um, stuff like that, methods and materials, I. Uh, I use a I use a, a dip pen mm -hmm. to 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 ink nowadays, but I used a brush back then, and I was like a super inker with a brush because I was using really crappy brushes at home. And mm -hmm. when you get your Kubert School art kit, you get like a real Kalinsky sable hair, like a good brush. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is easy, like holy crap! Because I was using like you know a super soft one before, mm -hmm. so I learned a lot. Um, but spiritually, like I had no I uh, know when, when I, I, I brought every issue of 8-Ball, mm -hmm. Hate, things like that. I brought those uh, Russ Cochran EC reprints, mm -hmm. and there were maybe one or two students I could talk to about that, and there was one teacher who I actually became pretty close with who was, a, um, he was an assistant to, mm -hmm. to Harvey Kurtzman during the mm -hmm. little Annie Fanny period, and I nice. like, latched onto that mm -hmm. guy because I'm like, everybody here is a dork. Like, like, like these are the people, they were talking smack on uh, cartoonists like McFar McFarland and Liefeld, mm -hmm. but they were reading comics like uh, Fathom and, and, and stuff like that. And I'm like, so you're making fun of this stuff, but, y but you're like glomming onto the, like the modern day version of what people think that stuff is. You know yeah. what I mean? So I'm just yeah. like, ah. Oh man. It was That's tough. It's weird that they could not relate to stuff like 8-Ball or Hate. Black and white comic, it was <coughs> weird. So they're like, oh, so like, is this like a variant? Like, where's the color? Like, they just never seen that Amazing. stuff. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. It was I weird. I thought that that place was more evolved. Not at all. If I, I never knew um, the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan existed, mm -hmm. but that's where I should have been. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I just didn't know it existed. Mm -hmm. I was so just ignorant um, growing up. And, and you know, th as the SVA doesn't have an ad in X-Men comics, uh, but, yeah. but, that, uh, but the Kubert School yeah, did. Yeah. So, so who's uh, teaching at SVA? Is that is Spiegelman there? Uh, are, you, are we talking about nowadays? Yeah, or, or back then too. Like uh, ba back then it would have been like Mazu Kelly, mm -hmm. Spiegelman, I think mm -hmm. Klaus Janssen was a teacher mm -hmm. there, Walt Simonson. Mm -hmm. um, those are the guys I could think of like right now. Yeah. 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 Um, but I, I found out about uh, SVA because of that teacher that I, I latched on to. His name was Phil Felix, and mm -hmm. he, was a, he was a journeyman letterer for Marvel mm -hmm. um, for 20 something years, and he went to SVA. And his fellow mm -hmm. students were like Drew Friedman, 
uh, Mark Newgarden, oh, Kaz, and their teachers were like the Mount Rushmore of comics. It was like Will Eisner, Spiegelman, Kurtzman, and you know, like oh my God. guys like that. It's like yeah. the, you just need Kirby, and you basically do yeah. have like the Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you got out after a year. Yeah, like like I um you know my parents didn't put a, uh, a college fund away or anything mm -hmm. like that, so I started receiving those bills, mm -hmm. and my whole thing was like I really want to be a cartoonist. I'm going to have to sink a lot of money to go to school for, uh, and it's not like we're going to leave school and do open heart surgery. So um, I spent about two years just making like just just getting in the black, paying off those loans. Did you did you have a hold down a real job? Yeah, I did. What yeah, were you I, doing? I worked in the call center. I'm so embarrassed to admit that I worked in the call center that that um, did order fulfillment or, and uh, customer service for, for those Marlboro catalogs where you cut out the, the, the miles and then you send away for a mm -hmm. raft or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> like if you would call the number, you would be talking to uh -huh. me <laughs> Okay. for like a year and a half, man. So I was like wow. contributing to people's demise mm -hmm. in, in that way, man, giving them rewards mm -hmm. for, you know, killing themselves. And so... So while you were doing this, is were you drawing also? And, and like, at what point did you hook up with with uh, Harvey? Um, I was working at the call center. I I didn't do that much drawing. That was like the only time in my life where that environment just zapped any creative capital I had inside my body just out of me, man. Um, and I was just running around, kind of being just a, a knucklehead, nineteen year old or something like that, and. That's right after Qbert School. A bunch of guys from the Qbert School gave me a call when they were in their second year. When they, you know, I was in school with them, but they were in their second year, and they just sounded like they were having a lot of fun. And 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 I'm like, you know what? I shouldn't be here. So I just really started putting every dime I I could squander to paying off these bills, just because I'm a nervous person. I don't like bills. I don't want to be in anybody's mm -hmm. debt. Take care of that. And I started putting my own comics together and sending them to places like Fanographics, Drawn and Quarterly, Slave Labor, getting just routine rejection letters regularly um, for a good reason. The stuff wasn't that great yet. Um, so my thoughts were to just send the comics to um, other creators who I liked and respected mm -hmm. to get some feedback mm -hmm. or, or, or things like that. And, um, and Harvey was on that list mm -hmm. of people that I sent stuff to. Not many artists had websites of their own right then. It was like, you know, 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. So I would just raid uh, the letters pages of comics mm -hmm. and, you know, just send stuff to everybody. And Harvey called, Harvey called one day, and then uh, this other uh, cartoonist, Jay Lynch, called mm -hmm. like within that week. And, and he's, you know, Jay Lynch is from, he, He's been working on uh, Garbage Pail Kids for the past 30 years doing concept art and things mm -hmm. like that. But he did a really cool comic uh, during the underground days called, um, called Nard and Pat. Mm -hmm. very, yeah, sure. very meticulous, very detail-oriented. And um, uh, I started working on comics for both of those guys. They, they would write and, and I drew. That's cool. Yeah. What, was, uh, what was Jay Lynch's title at that time? What, I mean, what, what were you doing for him? Uh, yeah, what we were doing, it was, it was basically like, uh, like two-fisted cartoonist tales. And his whole thing was that, you know, in this era of Adrian Tomine and Chris Ware type uh, sissy cartoonists, we as the underground, you know, cartoonists, we were tough guys and there was drugs and sex and rock and roll. So it was like, it was like autobio stories that had like a harder edge mm -hmm. as opposed to... My girlfriend broke up with me, and I'm so sad about it. Mm -hmm. uh, this sounds good. So it kind was of in the vein of like Denny Icorn. I would say, yeah, I would say mm -hmm. that's that's uh, that's a really good comparison. And we we um we're gonna have a single book, but uh, I did about 17 pages worth of strips, like five or six strips, and uh, those cartoonists of that era, they had a kind of a union going on back then, where mm -hmm. they all agreed that they wouldn't do. Uh, a page of comics for like less than 25 bucks or mm -hmm. something like that, a piece or something. Mm -hmm. And the business model of comics in 2000 was even less than that. <laughs> you know, so so he wasn't. Wow. See, he was it, because it's on spec. You know, if mm -hmm. you if you have a gangbusters hit, you'll make money, mm -hmm. but it's not guaranteed. Yeah. Uh, so it, that was a little. I mean, he just you know he's got to keep a roof over his head. I was a knucklehead, 20 year old mm -hmm. living with mom, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I had no worries about that kind of thing. 
Was it self-published? It, wa it wasn't. Um, we we uh, doled it out in a zine called Mineshaft, mm -hmm. which is which was distributed by uh, by Fanographics at that time. And it's it was it was for a while 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 uh, Crumb was putting together together that uh, book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. It's the only place you would see new Crumb artwork because they would put um, his sketchbooks and stuff. In this oh, thing. I do remember that. Yeah, yeah, I do remember. It was it tight. It was probably yeah. like one of the coolest zines to come out in the past ten years. Yeah, I would say. Sure, yeah, it still is coming out too. By the way, that's cool. Yeah, I, I do remember. He had like a, a Bigfoot cover. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And and the Bigfoot cover, like that's actually that was like Gene Gene Deitch or some somebody did that, but he had like Bigfoot pages on mm -hmm. the inside. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That in fact that was the first issue that I that uh, our stories appeared. In that, in that exact, like number 18. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, uh, what was your process of working with, uh, with Har Harvey Picar? Like, like, would he send you t typed pages, or did he have, like, thumbnail sketches? Or yeah, he had, he had the stick figure uh, scripts that you would have seen in the American Splendor mm -hmm. movie or whatever. And they were so complicated, like, just cluttered, and I couldn't read a lot of the words, so I would call them routinely every day, several times a day. It got to the point where I would just, like, make every note, uh, every, every, everything I was, like, confused about, I would just, like, you know, fill up a few pages in a notebook and then just call them at once at, like, the end of the mm -hmm. day. Like, okay, mm -hmm. on this panel, what's this? Uh, but I started to understand his, his uh, scripts after, as, as I went forward, and, um, and it was great. He was never a taskmaster. He was always very sorry that he couldn't command a bigger page rate from the different publishers mm -hmm. for us, and and in many cases he would take he would take almost nothing so that artists the artists can get paid. Mm -hmm. He was a very very cool guy, and wow, and the upper great. like when I started working with him, that was around when the movie came out. So he was never more popular than he was right at that mm -hmm. moment, mm -hmm. and and that's when I hooked up with him. So he's getting all these book offers and was just asking me, hey, do you want to draw this book? Do you want to draw really that book? Cool. It was very cool. Are you a fast drawer? I'm, I'm not fast, but I will, I will block everything else out mm -hmm. in life for the right <laughs> thing. Uh -huh. like, like, uh, like before, you know, I'm on tour right now, and it was a two-week tour or something. So I raced to get a hip-hop strip done before my travels mm -hmm. so that I could have at least one come out. Um, while on the road, but I called uh, Fanographics up and I'm going to be doing the free comic book day comic mm -hmm. uh, for 2015 for Fanographics. Cool. And um, it's the last thought in my mind right now. Um, so I asked the guys, hey, can you give me some sort of deadline just so that I keep that in the back of my mind so that I know when to deliver everything? And, and uh, Eric Reynolds, the associate publisher, is like, yeah, it's probably like around March or something. You know, it's going to come out in May. We get it printed in the s in the states or uh, like the mainland, mm -hmm. um, and then I get a, uh, an email an hour later like, oh, we need the cover like right now. Like like they're gonna start soliciting it. So rather than just draw like a cool Run DMC pic picture or something like that, I drew this wraparound cover with like 70, uh, 70 hip hop portraits of all the most cartoonish and cool looking looking guys, and and I drew that over the course of a weekend and just destroyed my wrist like so bad like Man. yeah the, but and I just took like a few naps here and there like whenever I was getting sloppy I would just mm -hmm. go to sleep and then like wake back up and eat peanut butter and jelly sandwich and just keep going yes. um, so uh, hip hop family tree um, it's just the the, uh, the packaging of it y you made a you made a lot of interesting design decisions you put a ton of thought into the format the color palette. Um, wh what was your thinking behind it? Why did you make those decisions? Wh what were you hoping to achieve? I really wanted it to, to look just like a book ripped from that time period. And uh, in, in a bigger sense, what I wanted to achieve was I just wanted to make a tangible object that, that people want because they want to they wanna feel it, they want to touch it. It's something that you can't download. Mm -hmm. And the biggest compliment that I ever get is going to these festivals and when people, when they're like massaging the pages and stuff because I was like, I made a lot of effort and dealt with like a lot of Chinese printers and stuff to try to figure out like, like what is this exact paper? I, I, mm -hmm. I destroyed a book that I had. I just ripped out the pages so I could send swatches to 
to uh, the to fan graphics mm -hmm. to to get on the case and try to discover what that paper is and things like that. Um, because in this world that we live in now, it's like every everybody's being more choosy about this, the the physical goods that they buy because you know it takes up space. I get it, um, but the book, like to me, my comics what I want my comics to be is more than just story. Like story is shallow to me, it's like superficial. Like mm -hmm. I want it to be a full experience. So even the, the size of the book was crucial to me because I wanted, uh, growing up, predominantly black neighborhood, uh, Superman versus Muhammad Ali was the only comic that a lot of my friends' parents had. And it's uh, about the same size mm -hmm. as Hip Hop Family Tree. So uh, like I had that in mind, like maybe my comic will be like right next to their issue of Superman versus Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like with that box set, there's this other little comic that comes with it, and it's a, it's a story told in the 1990s as opposed to the other, other books that take place between 75 and the very early 80s. Um, the, that little Ashcan comic, it comes, it, like, like it's a story that takes place in like 91 to 92 or 93 or something, so I wanted that to look like a product of its time, so it has like the foil embossed, you know, gold yeah. cover, and it's an ash can, which, which was a popular format, like kind of throwaway format for that time period. I just, I, I just, I'm a student of comics. I'm a fan of comics first, and it's a ball, just kind of uh, creating these counterfeit kind of things. Like even on that that ash can, like I didn't even use my name in a, I used a fake copyright date on the indicia mm -hmm. hoping that that the comic gets gets lost out of the slip case and just ends up in some random long boxes and then mm -hmm. people see it like how did this slip by me back in 1993 <laughs> that's awesome. yeah that's great um what about the the uh the hip hop artists that you're presenting in in this uh in, in your hip hop family tree what's been the response have have you been have they reached out to you and yeah it's been pretty much unanimous praise uh so far i'm i'm bracing myself in preparation for when when somebody comes out of the woodwork and hates me mm -hmm. because it's inevitable yeah um but sure. it hasn't happened yet mm -hmm. and a function of putting the work on boing boing on a routine basis uh you know as well as anybody that anonymous people on the internet are very happy to let you know if you put something out that has factual inaccurate mm -hmm. in inaccurate information or, or use if you screwed up mm -hmm. uh, so I use that opportunity at boing boing to um, present the material and if if anybody sees something that that is wrong like they have that chance to to just like let me know mm -hmm. and I'll correct it it hasn't come up yet because mm -hmm. I'm a beast about my yeah, research and good stuff because yeah, you you send the emails, you know, about right, yeah, that like you are going to cover and wondering about it, but yeah, it's yeah, you you do your research, obviously. So we we totally trust what you're doing. Yeah, that like that stuff. When I would send you those emails, it would be for drug-related things or, or just like stuff that could be s potentially slander, libelous stuff that that I get. Like we have to make a million percent sure mm -hmm. that these people put this information out there it's common knowledge like I'm not <laughs> fabricating uh, mm -hmm. this stuff um, and so when it comes to the drug things or or some sort of violent mm -hmm. uh, encounter like I make sure I have like five sources to, yeah, to back really up cool. if possible yeah that, that's smart so um, do you w how do you do your research do you look at old magazines books talk to people yeah, all, all of the above. With with the with the material that's presented in book one, um, that's all found material that, like like uh, documentaries, mm -hmm. uh, interviews that I find online, magazines, books. I use all that kind of stuff to to put together the comics. The when the comic came out, um, you know, it it, it sort of went gangbusters. It it hasn't been a year yet, and we're going into a fourth printing. So just to give that's you like great. some. Um, and hip hop people have discovered it, and it made the New York Times bestseller list, right? Did it did. It was. Yeah. It must have been a slow week in publishing <laughs> that week, man. No, it's well deserved. Um, in the in the hip hop community, p like like it's been a pilgrimage for people now to like take hip hop, uh, the first hip hop book 
take it to 1520 Sedgwick, which is like the birthplace mm -hmm. of hip hop, and like snap an Instagram photo, like holding That's the really book cool. in front of the marquee of the tenement, uh, which is which is awesome. But what I'm saying is, uh, hip hop people within the community got the book, saw the book, were sent a copy or whatever, and so now I can call people up. Mm -hmm. Hey, what? Did this really happen this way or, or things cool. like that? It is so cool. So you've gotten some cred. It is cool. But what I've been discovering is a, much of the information is a little bit useless to an extent because they'll, sh they'll try to sabotage one of their lyrical enemies or something mm -hmm. like no, that. Or, yeah. or, or, and they'll try to pump up their story or they'll say some pretty outlandish stuff that definitely falls into the realm of slander libel, which is extremely interesting. But it just cannot be in the comic, man, because it's like, I don't know if such and such was involved with the mafia. And that's why they got to, right. to be in this position. You know yeah. what I mean? But that's tough. I can see it's a two-edged sword. It is. W um, why don't we uh, take a couple of <laughs> questions? From all these people? Yeah. Look at all these guys. And, uh, see, I'm sure we've got, we can get a question from someone. I've been... Yeah, and that's a good question. I, I did, you're asking it in a different way that I did. Um, yeah, and, and how did you like stitch it all together and then make it come alive? Yeah, I uh, I consider myself like m more than a cartoonist. I consider myself like an archaeologist on this project, or like a curator of information. So the cool thing about reading interviews with hip hop pioneers, uh, especially if you're researching a particular song or something like that. There were no solo artists, right? So there were groups. And when there are groups, you could probably find multiple interviews with, from multiple people. And maybe if it's an important song, many interviews from multiple people about this one song. And I will just spend days combing through as much of that kind of stuff as I can find. And every time I do that, there is some extremely visually interesting, comic book worthy, scene revolved around whatever song it is that that you know i'm i i have to cover so like in the first book like one of my favorite uh my favorite things i that i sort of unearthed was um there's a very popular break beat that this group called the crash crew used um and that's how they made their their sort of name in the streets Th it's called the, they call it the freedom break but it's it's from a song called get up and dance um so they ha had a very popular song using that break. And then they signed with Sugar Hill, but Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, they had a song using that same break. So there was a rivalry in-house, and they played a game of football to settle who was going to be the group that got to use that, you know, to, who got to perform that song using that break while on tour. And Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, they stacked the deck, and they had uh, Big Bang Hank on their team. Rest in peace, he just died from uh, Sugar Hill Gang. And so Big Bang Hank was just, you know, monster trucking over the poor crash crew. I think that's so about it, huh? Yeah, yeah, well, any other, any other questions? <laughs> I think we're good. Yeah, no, that's good. Sure, yeah. It does, uh, and and uh, there are mechanics within comic book language that that absolve me from being the from making what I'm saying gospel. So an example would be a lot of the stuff that um, KRS One went through as a kid. He was homeless, living on the streets. There is no other source I can go to to vet the things that he's saying you know and a lot of that stuff sounds pretty hyperbolic and, and insane for sure uh, so I what I will do in the comic um, and just look for it in the top left corner of the panel I'll just say something you know as the legend goes dot 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 or something like that to just absolve myself 
from making this gospel, so to speak. And also, I, I think th that's a good thing to do because some of these legends uh, and kind of half-truths or whatever are kind of an important part of the history, too, because that's like the stories that were going around at the time, and it's just part of the mythos. You know? Right, right. Yeah, they need to be in there. They make my BS detector pin a little bit on red sometimes, mm -hmm. and in those cases, I will dance around yeah. the thing and, and to, to just like let people know that, that this isn't, this isn't a, a tr necessary truth that's being told by me. Mm -hmm. So do you have a stopping point with this? Like how many, uh, is it going to go to a third, following and fourth? Yeah, we're well into uh, book three on, on the Boing Boing website now. There's about 14 more pages to go. Uh, with I'm signed up for uh, six books mm -hmm. uh, right now. And that'll take me the next, you know, I could do one a year. Basically, each book is, is a year's worth of my, of my output. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, uh, if it's still fun, if I'm still having a ball, if it's still, you know, like as rewarding as it's been, not monetarily, but just, you know, I'm hanging out here in L.A. I've never been to L.A. And I was brought here on the strength of my comic. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of fun. Um, I'll just keep it going. You know, yeah. I have a lot more to say because the sixth book will not take me very far. It's not going to take me into the 90s mm -hmm. at all, by wow. any means. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Are there, final question. Do you have a, a deep uh, interest in something else that you might want to tackle later on in your career? I, I, do, I do. There's, there's a lot of stuff. And, and I love these, like, niche subcultures that, that, that um, just have a lot of, they're sort of underground. Uh, they make parents nervous, and and and, and uh, you know they're off the beaten path. And the book that I did before Hip Hop Family Tree was this comic called WYSIWYG mm -hmm. about computer technology, technology, hu computer hackers, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm real intrigued, and I pay attention a lot to um, to the dark net and and um, Tor hidden services, and and just you know I'm going to San Fran uh, tomorrow. And not one, but two Silk Road um, administrators like were operating their their illicit marketplaces from l the library in San Fran, and uh, so I read all the those indictments and and uh, the the nihilistic, uh, anarchistic, you know, landscape of of that like the the, the hidden internet. It's something that is is being. Um, misrepresented in a lot of ways mm -hmm. but there is also a lot of truth to it in in um, the mainstream media too and that's just like you could just even do fun fictional stories in that space because it's like you know it's a universe where everything is available like where you could like send some bitcoins to a site and get a, a rocket launcher or something <laughs> like you know <laughs> like <laughs> you know so so um stuff like that like I, I love skateboard culture. I have um, a superhero. I feel like every cartoonist should do like one superhero mm -hmm. story. So I have like some of those in me. Mm -hmm. And you know these books, like I said, do take a year for me to do. So there's a finite amount of those books that are possible. Um, so I'll probably take a break or something after and, and you know play around in a fictional space or something. That sounds great. Yeah. So so uh, just to uh, remind people, uh, I've been speaking with Ed Piscor. His new uh, latest uh, thing is the uh, two-volume box set of the Hip Hop Family Tree that comes with a cool, exclusive Ashcan insert comic that you can only get if you buy this two-volume set. Um, so uh, it's it's uh, I'm, I'm putting together Boing Boing's gift list, and, and this is on it because it's like it would be like the ultimate gift for a comic fan or or a music fan. Well, oh, th I thank you for that. And and it new new uh, strips appear every Tuesday on That's right. uh, Boing Boing. Boing Boing dot net. So hey Ed, thanks Smart. so much. I'm in. Thanks you guys. <laughs> thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah, I know it's hard to get out on.